Any other questions? If you want to see me, just send me an email, and I can usually get you in within a half a day or so. So I don't have any, like, I found that when I post fixed hours, no one comes. And then, like, the day before the test, they come. So I figure, you know, like, just make it at people's convenience. And I can. Thanks. Well, we don't have to teach, obviously. I mean, we could protest and say, no, I, I refuse to go to a policy committee meeting on Tuesday. But no, we're going to have a policy committee meeting on Tuesday. Aaron Wagner is the chair. He doesn't believe in breaks anyway. So, And of course, those of us who are Cornell hockey fans can't go away. You know, it's an important weekend. You know, they've got to work on making sure to scheduling, schedule these big games not on the February break weekend in the future. But anyway, this, this new calendar is a work in progress. It's an experiment. It's, running, it's going to run three years, see how it goes. And you will hear very soon, I know, I know from a meeting I was at yesterday, about the final exam schedule for the spring and the way they've optimized it, the various ways they tried optimizing it, and the way they finally settled on doing it. It's kind of interesting. So your opinions on that are welcome. I'm the chair of the Cornell Educational Policy Committee, which handles things like exam schedules, academic calendar, what you can do at the end of the semester, all those kind of things. And what's that? What about the shortening of senior week? Well, that one of the it, it, here's an interesting factoid that I don't know if I'm telling you something confidential, but there were they tried two different <laughs> yeah right two different schemes for optimizing the final exam schedule. Two of the several that they tried were the following. One of them optimized by making senior exams end early as much as possible so that they would have an unbroken for traditional senior week. And the other was optimizing by making large exams happen, large course exams happen earlier, which eases the grading burden on teachers and TAs of large courses. And as it happened, believe it or not, that second scenario made for fewer late senior exams than optimizing over late senior exams because of all the other things that are feeding into the optimization algorithm. For example, trying to minimize back-to-back -back exams, trying to minimize 3 and 24, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, it's interesting. It's a, like There will be some seniors, something like uh, 200 exam hyphen students, if you, if you understand what I mean by that, who have exams like Monday and Tuesday of what would have been senior week. Correct. Yeah, and seniors actually tend to take tend to take courses that either don't have finals or they are huge courses that they're sort of mopping up for fun, like Psych 101 or you know that kind of thing, right? And and so the big courses are optimized early or forced earlier by the scheme. So that's sort of why you're seeing fewer seniors at the end there. And the other courses seniors take tend to be projecty kind of things that don't have finals. Am I right, seniors? This class has a final, and I don't know when it's going to be yet. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. So let's continue this, this conversation about Markov chains. All right. So anyway, we're, we're uh, looking closely at Markov chains. And last time, I tried to draw this distinction between deterministic quantities and random quantities associated with Markov chains. And deterministic quantities are things like P of ij, the state space S itself, P of ij, pi of 0. F superscript K sub IJ. Now, what was that again? That was the probability that the first K is the first positive time that you hit J 
given that you start an I at time zero. Okay, so I'm abbreviating this so because we saw it already last time. Those are examples of deterministic quantities, and further examples building on these are Rij, which is the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of fkij. And that's just going to be the probability that you hit j in finite time, given that you start an i at time 0. And then we had random quantities associated with a Markov chain. And of course, these random quantities are related to the deterministic quantities, as we'll you know, see in various instances here. Say xn, that's just the state of the Markov chain at time n. And tj, what's that? That's going to be the first positive time you hit j. And of course, that's going to be a random quantity that depends on a lot of random outcomes. It's going to depend on the initial distribution. It's going to depend on all the coin flips that go along, all that kind of thing. And we noted that this was related to the fkij as follows. Probability, and this is notation I introduced last time, starting from i that tj equals k is equal to f superscript k sub ij. And this notation here stands for the probability of whatever's in the braces given that you started in state i at time 0. And we're going to be using that notation pretty freely. And also nj was another one we talked about. nj is the total number of times you hit state j in a complete run of the Markov chain. And I want to note that tj and or nj could be equal to infinity. So tj equals infinity. I don't think I noted this explicitly last time. Is possible. And when does that happen? When is tj equal to infinity? That happens when you never hit j. Okay. And nj equals infinity is possible as well. Given a state, you could hit it infinitely often in a run of the Markov chain. With, that's quite possible. Very important definition. A state j is transient if r j j. And what is this? This is the probability that you return to state j given that you started in state j at time 0. If that probability is less than 1, and it's called recurrent if this thing is equal to 1. So recurrent states are those to which you return with probability 1 in finite time, given that you started them at time 0. Okay. And at the very end of class last time, I was talking about the following fact. And this fact alludes to this nj when we're distinguishing between the behavior of the transient and recurrent states. And it goes like this, that j is transient, turns out to be if and only if, probability sub j that nj is less than infinity equals 1. And j is recurrent. Turns out to be if and only if. Probability sub j nj equals infinity equals 1. And therefore, the probability that nj is finite is 0. Now, what does this say? 
in English. That is to say, quote unquote, starting in a recurrent state J, you return to J infinitely often with probability 1. Okay? That's the big takeaway from that. That you hit recurrent states infinitely often provided you ever get to them turns out, but this is really about when you start in them. And starting in a transient state, J, returning infinitely often to J has, is a zero probability event. Okay? So you return to J infinitely often with probability zero. Okay, so it's just the opposite. It's and the, I want to emphasize that, that this is really strong because you're, you're saying not only is it true that maybe if you're in a recur if you start in a recurrent state you, you might or with probabil positive probability return to it infinitely often. You are sure to return to it infinitely often. Okay? That's important. It's a very strong statement about the recurrence of recurrent states. OK, now, uh, as I told you when we started this Markov chain discussion, I'm not going to go through detailed proofs of things in class in general. OK? I'm going to refer you to the handout. And I, you know, I've been looking over the handout. I'm thinking, well, this, it's OK. Some of the, the big, horrible proofs are in an appendix. I would just say ignore those unless you really want to get to the mathematical details. But buried in the main part of the text are some fairly easy proofs. I'm still not going to go over most of those in class, but I, I recommend that you try to read them just to get an idea of where I'm coming from on this. Now, let me just talk about this fact. Why is it true? Why is it true that, intuitively at least, j is transient, then probability of nj equals infinity, nj less than infinity is 1, and if j is recurrent, then nj is equal to infinity with probability 1. Let's think about the recurrent case first. So say J is recurrent. Okay. What's the probability sub J that NJ equals zero? That you never return to state J. Yeah. It's zero, yeah, because it's recurrent. You return to state J in finite time with probability 1. It's equal, this is equal to, if you want to state it in terms of the R's and all that kind of stuff, this is 1 minus RJJ. RJJ is the probability that you return to state J in finite time having started in state J. We know that for a recurrent state, by definition, that's 1 and that's 0. Okay? Probability sub J that NJ equals 1. How much is, what is that equal to? What does it mean for nj to equal 1? It means that you return to j in finite time for some k, at time k, and then you follow a path that never comes back to j. So let me write that out in English. This is the same as the probability sub j. Remember, this means probability given that you started in state j that you hit, you return to J at some finite time, then follow a path that never returns to J. And you can write that as the sum from K equals 1 to infinity of the probability that you first return to j at time k, given that you started in j, times 
the probability that you follow a path that never returns to j, which is 1 minus rjj. And again, because rjj is 1, this is 0. Okay. Now you can keep this up. An easy induction shows you that the probability that starting from j that mj equals say what do I want to use here how about nj equals l or whatever this turns out to be the probability that you follow a path that returns to j l times and then follow a path that never returns to j. And again, this is 0, so this is 0. All right. Conclusion. For any finite value, any finite number, the probability that nj equals that finite number is 0. So the bottom line is probability that, starting from j, you return to j exactly l times is equal to 0 for all l in the natural numbers, which is the same thing as saying that the probability that you start starting in state j and j equals infinity is equal to 1. Okay. This is the kind of reasoning that goes into these proofs most of which I'm not going to do in class, but that I think some of them are important because they give you a grip on what's going on. Okay? So everybody got that? That's when J is recurrent. Suppose J is transient. So say J is transient. We can go through the same calculation. And the only difference is going to be that this 1 minus rjj is no longer going to be 0, because rjj is less than 1. The probability of return to a transient state in finite time, given you started there, is less than 1. So you get that the probability starting from j, that mj equals 0, is 1 minus rjj. But that's not necessarily 0 anymore. In fact, it's not 0 by definition of transients. And the probability sub j that mj equals 1. From this formula, by the way, if you factor out the 1 minus rjj, this sum of all the fk sub jj's is just rjj. So you get rjj times 1 minus rjj. And so on and so on. The probability that nj equals L, given that you started state j, is going to be rjj to the L times 1 minus rjj. None of these is 0. So none of these is 0. What do they sum to? Let's see. Because whatever they sum to, that's going to be the probability that nj is finite. Let's sum them up and see. So thus, the probability that, given that you start in state j, and j is less than infinity, that's the sum over all L from L equals 0 to infinity, the probability that, given you start in state j, and j equals L. And that's going to be, if you just look at that, it's just going to be the sum from L equals 0 to infinity, 1 minus rjj. 
That's the path that goes off and never comes back to J times RJJ to the L. Those are the paths that return to J L times. And look at that. It's a geometric series with a factor you can factor out. So it's 1 minus RJJ times the sum of RJJ to the L over all L. And that's just 1 minus RJJ over 1 minus RJJ by geometric series equals 1. And there you have it. OK, so recurrence means that with probability 1, you only return there finite times, finitely many times given you started there. Transients, or <laughs> no, say it again. Transients means that with probability 1, you return there finitely many times with probability 1. Recurrence means that with probability 1, you return there infinitely often. It's always good to keep that sort of thought in your head. OK, so everybody get this, sort of? These are examples of simple proofs of things. If you want to see something complicated, look at the ones in the appendix of the handout. <laughs> or in any of the books. There, there are many books, by the way, that cover this stuff, some better than others, as you know. What book did you guys use in 4110, Andrew? For more than a doorstop. <laughs> Very generic probability book. That's a really lame title. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Good. You know, I learned after freshman year, after selling all my books, not to sell my books. <laughs> Randy. I had a question about R J J to the L. Yeah. How does that work? Okay. Well, for, do you see how this one comes out to be RJJ yeah. times 1 minus RJJ? Yeah. OK, well, an easy induction. OK, if, if I say, OK, that, I'm hoping that's the pattern. I'm hoping that the things that return once are RJJ to the first times 1 minus RJJ. The things that return L times are RJJ to the L times 1 minus RJJ. Let's prove that by induction. Assuming you've proved it for L, you could show it holds for L plus 1 by saying that the probability that you return L plus 1 times is the sum of F K J J times the probability you return L times. See, if it, it has to return once in finite time at some point and then follow a path that goes there L times. And so again, you get an expression that looks like this, except what's here is RJJ to the L times 1 minus RJJ, so you get RJJ to the L plus 1. So that's what the easy induction I was alluding to is what you're asking about. I mean, I, I would say it's an easy induction, but I'm not like throwing that down as a gauntlet, saying, you know, if this is not easy to you, you're lame. Or Yes? So I'm still a little confused about the difference between recurrent and transient yes. state. What do you mean by return to the infinitely often with probability 1 and infinitely often with probability 0? What is it exactly? I mean, I don't know. Okay. Okay. If you think of the Markov chain as, you know, that th there's many different paths it can follow, okay, starting from state J, okay? And there are certain events, like, for example, the event, quote, the Markov chain follows a path that returns L times to state J, unquote. What's the probability of that event, right? What's the probability that among all the pa you know the paths you follow is one that returns l times exactly to state j? And what we've shown here is that when j is recurrent, the probability that you return exactly l times to j is 0 for all finite l. Whereas when j is transient, the probability that you return exactly l times is this, which is not 0 by virtue of the RJJ less than 1 for transient state. Okay, So the event that you return infinitely often is the same as the complement of the event. Quote, you return exactly L times for some L. You know, the union over all L of that you return exactly at time L. I don't know. Sometimes when I try to restate things in different ways, I say them in such an infinitely confusing fashion that, you know, 
right now we just proved that the probability, you know, that n j is less than infinity is actually one. When j is transient. When j is transient. Yeah. Whereas it's zero when j is recurrent. Okay, Rishi first. Well, you're, we're talking here about the probability sub j. Okay. So this is the probability given that you started in j, that you return to j that many times. So the only thing involved is rjj. There's no rijs or anything involved. Okay. Got it? Like, well, we're, I'm just looking at that for now. You know, it turns out we're going to consider what happens when you, you start from other states. Like, how many times are you going to hit a recurrent state if you start at some arbitrary state i? That's going to be infinity with some probability and zero with some other probability, right? Okay. And by the way, I'm embarrassed. I don't know your name. I see you all the time. I don't think you're an ECE. I'm Robert. Robert? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I still have a question about the RJJ to the L. Yes. It seems a little bit unintuitive because let's say you have two states. Yep. Um, one and two. Two being a sync state. One has a low probability of going to two mm -hmm. and a high probability of staying at one. Yes. Essentially, the bigger you make NJ, um, or N1, the lower the probability given the formula will be here. Okay, in, it, we're going to we're gonna look at exactly that example in a few minutes in the context of TJs and all that kind of stuff. But the, pro but the problem there is the, both of those states are recurrent. So NJ is infinity for both of them. You hit them infinitely often. But let's ask a finer question, a more refined question, than how many times do you hit it total. Let's ask how big a fraction of the time do you spend in that state? What if one is recurrent and the other one is transient? It turns out you cannot have, uh, it, well, if one is recurrent and the other is transient. So one links to two, but two only links to itself. Yeah. And one links to one. Yeah. So one has a high probability of going to one. Right. Low probability of going to two. Yes. Two has a probability of one of going to two. Right. So in that one, one will be transient, the other one will be recurrent, right? Yes. And, in, and all we've discussed right now is what happens given that you start in that recurrent state. Okay, or in that transient state, and look at how many times you return to that state. Okay, so I for your example, you've got one that goes to one with some probability, and two with some probability, and two that always stays there. Okay, given that you start in one with probability one, you're going to end up in two, and therefore you're not going to you're end up in two in finite time, and therefore you're not going to and j is going to be less than infinity, and one is going to be less than infinity with probability one. RJJ to some power, which is always going to get smaller. Yes, the probability of going to it once is higher than the probability of going to it twice, is higher than the probability of going to it three times, and so on. That is, that is, that is correct. In fact, that's true of these in general. You can see that as L goes up, this goes down. Yeah, when you have a transient state, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bad bet that it'll come back a lot of times to that state. But, but sometimes you're interested in how bad a bet is it that it comes back a lot of times. And it, you know, that's where we get into this whole issue about the intermediate time behavior of Markov chains versus limiting behavior. So anyway, good questions these are, by the way. Any others? Andrew? OK. OK. Haven't heard of that one. <laughs> Any other questions? I saw some other hands up. Don't hesitate to. This is good. This is good. I like this. Because I'm sure that some of you guys who aren't asking questions are getting your questions kind of asked in some form by these other people. These other aggressive people, like Randy, you know, such an aggressive guy. <laughs> can you read the board, by the way, when I write down low? OK. How about you, Paul? Can you read the sort of? See, because the guys in the back row last time were really upset about the, the low board thing. OK. All right. All right. So anyway, that's, that's NJ. And this is a good, this is a really, I'm glad we're going through this in detail because it's important, like I said, it's the kind of lot of reasoning to go through. Yes. So uh, right now we're just assuming that uh, the probability that you go to trans uh, the recurrent state, given that you start in the same recurrent state, is one a probability that NJ equals infinity or 
Yeah, so, the, the, the definition of recurrence right. is that the probability that you return in finite time to that state, mm -hmm. given that you started in that state, equals one. Right. That's the definition of recurrence. So what would happen if we start off in a different, maybe transient state? Right. Uh, and then if you want to find the probability that, one, that we end up in the recurrent state. What, yeah, that's, that that's yeah, we're going to see that. I, 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 we haven't looked at that yet. OK. All right. Well, let's look at it just for that. Yeah. The transition diagram? Yeah. So when, when you draw, like, you know, one loops to itself, loops to two, loops to itself, uh -huh. isn't that already stating, like, whether one will start up, whether it's recurrent or transient? Because it has a, one has the, you know, it has the option to escape from one. Recurrence and transients definitely are determined by the state transition diagram for the Markov chain. Yeah. That is, that is for sure. Yep. The initial distribution has nothing to do with recurrence that's or that's the question, whether it was determined by the initial um, okay. That has nothing to do with it, yeah. Good questions. Good questions, everybody. Okay. So l let's address your question. Okay. So what about what if you start in some arbitrary state I say, okay, and ask, quote unquote, what is the probability, given that you start in state i, that nj equals infinity, or the probability, given that you start in state i, that nj equals infinity, and so on, okay? I claim that the following is true. Okay, and let's see if we can reason why this is the case. Okay. If J is transient, then for any state I, probability, given that you started in state I, that NJ equals infinity, is equal to zero. Actually, let's put it in a positive, a half full way. Okay? The probability that nj is less than infinity equals 1. Okay? Whereas if j is recurrent, let's see if someone can guess this, someone who's not a Markov chain aficionado. It turns out that the probability, this merits a spot in the higher board latitudes the probability that given that you start in state i that nj equals infinity is equal to what do you think what do you think it's equal to one he says what if, what if, <laughs> Kyle? Well, I, I, th I claim that using our notation, you can give an exact formula for this. Matt? R of ij. He says R of ij, by which he means R ij, or R sub ij. And indeed, that is correct. What does that mean? What, what, what's, what's this all about? This says, suppose you start in state i. What is it going to take? First of all, let's look at the transient case is easy, right? If j is transient, then no matter where you start, if you, if you never hit j, then certainly nj is less than infinity, right? nj is 0. If you do hit j, then you reset and you apply this theorem over here that says that the probability that you return to j infinitely often is 0. Therefore, the probability that you return to j finitely often is 1. Therefore, no matter where you start, the number of times you hit j is going to be finite with probability 1. 
Whereas if j is recurrent, two things can happen when you start in state i. Thing number one, you never hit state j, right? What's the probability of that happening? One minus this, right? If you never hit state j, then nj is zero, so certainly it's finite. The other thing that can happen is you hit j, and that happens with probability one. And what happens once you hit j? You're in this ballpark. You're, you're starting at j, and you're going to return infinitely often, right? And so I can append to this the following, probability sub i that nj equals zero is equal to one minus rij, and nothing in between. Nothing in between. Okay, there, there is zero probability that you'll ever come back to a recurrent state, say, 59 times once you hit it, no matter where you start, because the Markov chain doesn't remember where you started. Once you hit J, you're in this theorem. You're not in this one anymore. Okay? So that's sort of trying to get at what you were asking earlier. Is that an approximation of what you were? Uh, yes, but again, so it, doesn't it depend on where we start from? As in whether I is recurrent or transient? Wouldn't that? Well, this is, this is for an arbitrary st starting state I. Right. The question we're asking here is, what is the probability that you hit J, some other state, infinitely often, given that you started in state I? And the answer is, zero if j is a transient state and if j is a recurrent state it it's either rij or it's either infinity with probability rij or zero with probability one minus rij and so it really doesn't matter whether i was recurrent or it doesn't matter whether i was recurrent or transient if i is recurrent then you'll also be returning to i infinitely often but all we're asking here is how many times you return to j okay no, the right. okay <laughs> All right, Rishi. Yeah, yeah. Once you're once you're somewhere, everything resets. That's the key thing about the Markov property. Okay. All right. All right. Now the more sort of delicate question that you were sort of dancing around earlier. Okay, is is it's a little more refined question. So here's a more refined question. A more refined question. That has to do with how much time, how, what fraction of the time on the average do you spend in, say, a, a given state? Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to phrase it in a deliberately vague fashion, and this is just going to warm us up for the discussion later on. So rather than just asking how many times do you hit a state, okay, overall time, what fraction of the time, and I'll put that whole phrase in quotes because, you know, what does that mean? We'll try to pin it down a little bit. Do you spend in various states? Given that you started at, say, state i at time 0, what fraction of the time do you spend in state j? Or what expected fraction of the time, or whatever? To the, to the end of answering this question, what is the intuition behind this question? The intuition behind this question is, if it takes a really long time on the average to come back to state j, given that I started there, even if j is recurrent, then I'm not going to spend a huge fraction of the time in state j. But if it takes a short time on the average to return to state j, given that I started in j, I'm probably going to spend a reasonable amount of time there. Okay. So here's an example to keep in the back of your mind. And this is related to what we were talking about a minute ago. And we discussed the intuition behind this already a bit. You've got this situation. You've got 1 minus pp, q, and 1 minus q. It's amazing how you can 
build intuition for these things from very simple examples. And once again, P and Q are both positive and less than 1. And remember, we were, we were talking about like, like if P and Q are both a half, then it turns out you spend like half the time in state 1 and half the time in state 2. And you sort of see a random sequence of 1s and 2s going by. But, but for example, if P is much smaller than Q, say, then it's going to be relatively easy to get from 2 back to 1, but relatively hard to get from 1 back to 2. So what you expect to see is really long run of 1s, right? And then you go over to 2 and a relatively short run of 2s, and then you're back to 1 again and you have another really long run. So, so if P is, say, less than Q, you quote unquote expect to spend quote unquote more time on the average in 1 than in 2, right? Makes sense? All right. So, so let's see how we can address that question. So let's, uh, the approach is going to be, I want to talk now about the TJs. So recall that. Tj is equal to the first positive time you hit state j. Okay, and probability that Tj is equal to k is fk sub jj, or uh, probability sub j that Tj whatever. Okay. So, so let's see what's going on here. <coughs> So here's basic fact, and it's essentially the definition of transient and recurrence, transients and recurrence. J is transient if and only if probability sub J that Tj is less than infinity is less than 1, and J is recurrent. if and only if the probability sub j that tj is less than infinity equals 1. You return to j in finite time with probability 1 if and only if j is recurrent. You return to j in finite time maybe with some positive probability but not with probability 1. That means j is transient. Okay? Yep, Matt. It, yeah, you're, you're the first positive time. That's what the TJ is never defined to include time zero. Okay. All right. So so anyway. Actually, now is a good time to take the the three minute break, and then we'll we'll pick this up. I just looked at. I, I wanted to make sure I was getting keeping my notation in parallel with the handout, and I remember there was one other little calculation around these NJs that I wanted to do before we moved on to the TJ discussion. So let me quick throw that in, and I apologize for the the break in the sequence here. So before we continue with this, here's one more sort of NJ related calculation. Okay. Here's a question. What is, what is the expected value given that you started in state i? So what is e sub i? This is our first e sub i thing we're calculating. This is why I want to do it. We've been doing probability sub i, probability sub j, all that kind of stuff. What is e sub i of nj? the expected value of nj given that you started in state i. Okay. If j is recurrent, what is it going to be? Is 
if j is recurrent, then e sub i of nj is going to equal what? Well, nj is going to equal infinity with probability rij, right? And 0 with probability 1 minus rij. So let's write it this way, 1 minus rij times 0 plus rij times infinity. And that's equal to infinity if rij is positive and 0 if rij equals 0. And don't worry about this, oh, well, wait, are you saying 0 times infinity is 0 or anything like that? Just spare me, OK? <laughs> always max, always max, giving me a hard time. OK, so what if j is transient? What if j is transient? Well, we have figured out the probability that starting from state i, nj equals l for any l. Pretty much. So if J is, if J is transient, then the probability sub i that nj equals l, and this is using reasoning as above, namely when we're looking at probability sub j that nj equals l, the probability sub i that nj equals l is what? Well, it's going to be the probability that starting in i, you hit state j in finite time, then hit it L minus 1 more times, and then follow a path that never comes back. So it's going to turn out to be Rij times Rjj to the L minus 1 times 1 minus Rjj. And let me write that out in English. This is the probability that you hit J, then return L minus 1 times, then follow a path that never returns. OK? So what does that mean? That means that the expected value, given that you started an i of nj, is equal to the sum over L, sum from L equals 0 to infinity, or, yeah, L equals 0 to infinity, of Rij times Rjj to the L minus 1 times 1 minus Rjj, with an L in front of it, each term, right? Because to find the expected value of something, you take the sum over the possible values of the thing times the probability that the thing takes on those values. So let's figure out what that is. That's going to be Rij times 1 minus Rjj times the sum from L equals 0 to infinity of L Rjj to the L minus 1. And using derivative of geometric series all hyphenated reasoning, or underscored if you prefer, this is the same as Rij times 1 minus Rjj times minus derivative with respect to rjj of 1 over 1 minus rjj, which is just one, minus, 1 over 1 minus rjj squared. That comes out to be rij over 1 minus rjj. So that's the formula for the expected value of the number of times you hit state j, given that you started in state i, when j is a transient state. And you can see that, it, you know, here's some loose Markov chain talk, okay? That the, <laughs> yeah, loose talk about Markov chains, right? The more transient J is, what does that, what do I mean by that? 
the closer to zero RJJ is, the smaller this is going to be. But the closer to being recurrent the state J is, that is to say, the, the closer to one RJJ is, the higher that's going to be. You're, you expect to see J many times if its return probability is almost one. Okay. All right. So that, that's a calculation I meant to do before I started talking about the TJ. So let's get back now to the TJ. Yeah, uh, sure. If, if I have ended the expected value uh, that I started state I, and I hit state J. No, it's the expected value of the number of times you hit state J, given you that you start I. in state I. Yes. Yes. All right, so now let's get back to the TJs. The, the TJ is the first positive time you hit state J. And if J is transient, then, then you might never come back to J, given that you started in J. If J is recurrent, then you're definitely going to come back to J, if, given that you started in J. OK. All right. So let's, let's look at this example. And let's compute the expected value given that you started in one of these states of Tj. So let's, let's compute, say, Ej of Tj for an example, just to see what's going on. Okay. So here's the example again. It's going to be the PQ example. And let's look at, say, E2 of T2. This is just the expected value of the first return time to state 2, given that you started in state 2. Let's see what that is. Let's just figure out what that is. How do we figure that out? To figure out the expected value of a random variable, well, you have to look at all the possible values it takes on. And then you have to look at the probability that takes on each of those possible values. And then you have to sum up the products of value and probability. So what is the probability that, starting from 2, t2 equals 1? Let's just get, let's get a grip on our notation here. You tell me what this is. The probability that I return for the first time to state 2 at time 1, given that I started at state 2. Very easy. What is it? Sorry? Q? One minus, one minus Q, yeah. OK. Right. Because the only way that I can first return to state 2 at time 1 is when I follow this branch. And that happens with probability 1 minus Q. What is probability sub 2 that T2 equals 2? There's also only one way to do that. Now remember, T2 is the first return time. OK, so there's only one way. PQ, exactly. What's the probability, starting in state 2, that T2 equals 3? How can, how can that happen? What do I have to do? I have to go over here to 1, linger in 1, for one iteration, right, and then return. So this is going to be PQ times 1 minus P. And now you see the pattern, right? Now you see the pattern. The pattern goes like this. The probability that T2 
given the starting state 2, that T2 equals L is going to be, you go over to 1, you linger there for L minus 2 times, and then you come back, right? That's the pattern. Yes? That's this case. This is for L bigger than or equal to 3, let's say. Everybody see that? It's, it is true for L bigger than or equal to 2 as well. <laughs> Everybody see that? All right. So let's figure out the expected value of T2 given that you started state 2. E2 of T2 is equal to 1 times 1 minus Q plus PQ times the sum from L equals 2 to infinity of 1 minus P to the L minus 2. But I have to put an L in there because I'm computing expected value, right? See that? Now we can figure out a formula. We can figure out a nice expression for that. Let's do that. And this, I always have to. Well, uh, there are various ways. Oh, you're talking about the series? Yeah, let me show you how. This is the way I, I did it last night. Okay, so I'm going to stick with it because if I try to depart from my late night reasoning, I'll end up with my early morning reasoning, which is far inferior to my late night reasoning in general. I don't know about you guys. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to change the index of summation, okay, to, so it's 1 minus q plus pq times the sum from m equals 1 to infinity of, have this become m equals l minus 1, so l equals m plus 1, 1 minus p to the m minus 1. Okay, that's the first step. And then I'm going to split the sum into two pieces. The first piece is going to be m times 1 minus p to the m minus 1 summed. The second piece is going to be this, okay, that second piece there comes out to be just 1 over 1 minus 1 minus p by geometric series reasoning. So this is just 1 over p. Yeah, but I have to the m minus 1 here. So de facto, it starts from 0, right? Whereas de jure it doesn't, or something, <laughs> right? See what I mean? Right. Okay, so that comes out to be one one over p. This one is a derivative type of thing, right? This is equal to minus d by dp of one over one minus one minus p. So it's going to be one over p, and so that's going to be one over p squared with a positive sign. Okay. So far, so good. So that comes out to be 1 minus q plus pq times 1 over p squared 
plus 1 over p. And now cancellations occur. The q cancels with pq times 1 over p. So I have 1 plus q over p. And another way of writing that is p plus q over p. Okay, so that's the expected value of the first time I return to state 2, first positive time I return to state 2, given that I started state 2, Drew. I'm still a little confused about when you write the sum as the derivative of the expected Okay, the mth term here is minus d by dp of 1 minus p to the m. Right? And if I have just 1 minus p to the m, then that's going to sum up to 1 over p, because it's 1 over 1 minus 1 minus p. I don't know. I know that's the right answer, so <laughs> <laughs> I just know it. <laughs> so yeah, OK. All right, so, so similarly, similarly, you can show that given that you started in state 1, the expected value of the first return time to t1 is p plus q over q, right? Now let's look at these qualitatively given, you know, we talked qualitatively about this picture before. So suppose, for example, say, what was the, what was the one I used earlier? Was it q much less than p or p much less than q? So suppose p is much less than q, OK? Then this one is going to be way bigger than this one, right? In other words, the expected amount of time you have to wait to return to state 2, given that you start in a state 2, is going to be a lot bigger than the expected amount of time you have to wait, given that you started in state 1, to return to state 1. Now, why does that make sense? If p is much less than q, that means that once you're in 1, you tend to be stuck there for a long time, right? Versus once you're in 2, you can fairly easily get back to 1. So that makes sense, right? Once you're in state 1, which you have to go to in order to get back to state 2 at some positive time, or time bigger than 1, then you're stuck in 1 for a long time. So this is not surprising. If you go to 1 from 2, then you're stuck in 1 for a long time on the average. which means that it takes a long time on average to return to state 2. OK, so I, I just wanted to do one of these calculations you know, for a simple example, the expected value of T1, or the expected value of one of these Tj's and everything. OK. <clears throat> All right, so now what I want to do is I want to back off and, and talk about the global, or just talk for a little bit about the global structure of Markov chains in terms of the state space, and then pull all this T and N stuff together to see what we expect typical runs of the Markov chain to do and how much time. Yeah? Uh, so right now we just find out E sub J or, or P of J or whatever you want to call it. Yep. It's E sub I of TJ. E sub I of TJ? Well, you can figure that and out too. Would it be like, how different would it be from? Well, we could figure it out. Like um, E sub 1 of T2, you, you'd have to go through the same kind of calculation. I, I don't know by heart what the formula is, but 
It turns out that the EJ sub TJs are very important numbers associated with the Markov chain, which is why I'm putting heavy emphasis on them rather than the E sub I of TJ. Okay, so, so now what I want to do is I want to look a little bit more at the sort of the global structure of the Markov chain. We, we've already divided the states into transient states and recurrent states. So let's, for the moment, let's back off from these sort of micro calculations and look at sort of some global structural issues for Markov chains. And again, these, the answers to the questions we're about to ask don't depend on the initial distribution at all. You know, they, d they depend only on the transition diagram. And the initial distribution hasn't played any role in what we've done so far. And it will shortly, but not today. OK. So here's an important fact. Before I state the important fact, I better state the definition that goes along with it. OK, here's, so here's some notation. We write i goes to j when i and j are states to mean that it's possible to get from state i to state j in finite time. And the same thing, that's the same thing as saying R sub IJ is positive. Right? That is to say, with positive probability, you can get to state J in finite time, given that you started in I. So that's what it means for i goes to j. And that's how I'll say that, i goes to j. Now, here's another equivalent condition to i goes to j. So here's an observation. i goes to j is the same as saying not only rij is bigger than 0, but fk sub ij is bigger than 0 for some k, bigger than 0, or p superscript m of ij is bigger than 0 for some m bigger than 0. Why? Well, fk ij bigger than 0 for some k is the same as saying rij is bigger than 0, because rij is just the sum over the, of, of all the fks sub ij's. Saying this is true, that's the same as saying that there is positive probability for some finite time m that you make an m-step transition from i to j. So those are equivalent ways of saying i goes to j. It's not the same as saying, I want to emphasize this, all caps. Not the same as saying that p of ij is bigger than 0. That is to say that there exists an arrow from state i to state j in the transition diagram. It's not the same as saying that. Very important. Okay. Despite the fact that we're using arrows and i's and j's, it's not the same as saying that. All right, and here's the important fact, which I guess we'll have to prove next time, because we're at our limits. So here's an important fact. If I is recurrent, and i goes to j, then j is also recurrent. Moreover, rij and rji are both equal to 1. 
All right. So in other words, if you start in a recurrent state and you can get to some other state, it turns out that that state has to be recurrent as well. And the intuition behind that is if it's not, right, you can imagine going there and then never coming back to i, which would contradict recurrence of i. Well, we'll get to that next time. Don't want to do it today. So.